Welcome to today's webinar, The Artistic Brain, a Neuroaesthetics Approach to Health, Well-Being, and Learning, featuring Dr. Susan Magsiman. I'm Kelly Vermol, the Senior Director of Programs at Columbia University Zuckerman Institute. I'll be moderating the webinar today. During this presentation, you'll learn about neuroaesthetics, a field that explores how the brain responds to art. We'll address questions that the audience submitted at the end of the presentation. This webinar is one of many ways you can learn more about how the brain works through the resources at brainfacts.org. If you're interested in exploring these other resources, you can let your curiosity guide you on their website. You can see on the homepage that BrainFacts has five broad topic areas organized along the top with many articles of interest in each category. For example, the topic Neuroscience in Society has content related to technology and arts effect on the brain a topic of particular interest to those in this audience, perhaps, as well as special materials for educators on this and many other topics. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Susan Magsiman is the founder and executive director of the International Arts and Mind Lab, a neuroaesthetics initiative from the Brain Science Institute at Johns Hopkins. Her work lies at the intersection of brain science and the arts and how our unique response to aesthetic experiences can amplify human potential. In addition to her role at IAM Lab, she also serves as Senior Advisor to the Science of Learning Institute at Johns Hopkins. And now, here to tell us about the artistic brain, a neuroaesthetics approach to health, well-being, and learning, I welcome Susan Magsiman. Susan? Thank you, Kelly. It's a pleasure to be here. Today, I want to talk about the power of the arts and their impact on health, well-being, and learning. What if you could design a space to promote insights and creativity and innovation? What if you could use art and nature to accelerate healing? What if you could use music to ease stress and reduce pain? And what if you could enhance learning through making art? The arts change our brains and they can make us happier, healthier, and smarter. At the International Arts and Mind Lab, we are dedicated to amplifying human potential through the scientific study of the arts. The IM Lab is a center for applied neuroaesthetics from the Brain Science Institute at Johns Hopkins University. What does that mean? Well, specifically, we are looking at the arts as a tool to solve complex problems in health, well-being, and learning. We do this by bringing together brain scientists and practitioners in architecture, music, and the arts to foster collaboration, conduct research, and grow a global neuroaesthetics community. How we do this is through research, community building, outreach, and education. And to just talk a little bit about that, um, in the research area, we're focused on basic research, um, looking at the neurobiological mechanisms of the arts, and we're also very interested in translation. The impact thinking model that I mentioned a few moments ago um, is very interested in creating a consensus framework for how we think about solving problems all the way through to how we disseminate and scale them. And then we have a number of advisory boards that are interested in developing rigorous uh, uh, systematic approaches to the way we both research the arts and think about the practice of the arts in different uh, sectors around the, around the world. In community building, we're very interested in um, helping to build a field. So we look at both creating events and attending events. We have a number of partnerships with organizations, including the Society for Neuroscience, um, the American Association of Architects, the, uh, the, the creative arts therapy community, um, organizations that are interested in reaching out to use the arts, whether it's through research or applying that research to practice. And we're also very interested in how we communicate that. So um, on our website, you can see blogs. We also have um, different kinds of forums and social media that we use to share the science of the arts um, to a broad range of constituencies. And then thirdly, we work in outreach and education. And here we've developed a number of classes and webinars that share 
with professionals in the field information about the science of the arts as well as publications and also conferences. So what is neuroaesthetics? Neuroaesthetics is quite simply the way that we explore the impact of our sensory experiences in the world around us on the human brain and behavior. So the arts come in many forms, um, architecture, music, video arts, digital arts, dancing, music, writing, theater. Um, you probably can think in your own lives of many of the ways that the arts are, there, are things that you create or things that you um, behold. Um, I always like to tell the story of my grandmother who was a knitter and my grandmother knitted thousands of slippers uh, and gave them away to the world. That was how she found her voice and how she shared her voice through her art. Um, so the arts don't have to be something on a stage um, by professionals in case, in, in fact, in many cases, they're not. Um, we all do, the, we all have some kind of art experience that we use in our daily lives. And we marry that to the mind or the brain. So we look at the sensory perceptions of how we bring the world in. The combination of those two things equal impact. So how can this integration, this marriage, if you will, of the arts and mind equal um, some kind of change in your health, in your well-being, or in how you learn and grow? To go a little deeper, um, in 2017, um, Anjan Chatterjee and colleagues uh, started to really think more deeply about what the idea of an aesthetic experience really is. So throughout our days, we all have experiences um, where we bring in our senses, but not all experiences are elevated to what we would consider to be a peak experience or an aesthetic experience, uh, an experience that's transcendent. Um, Anjan looked very carefully at what were the components that really created this perfect storm of an aesthetic triad. And here he looked at three different types of neural systems. The first, looking at knowledge and meaning. So what kind of expertise or context or culture do we bring to a situation or to an experience? The second is sensory motor. What are the sensations and the feelings, the motor changes that happen when we are having some kind of experience? And the third is looking at emotion and what he calls valuation. What is the reward or emotion or the, the preference, the liking or the wanting that happens in that, in that experience. When those three things come together, we form what is called the aesthetic triad. And this is really where an aesthetic or peak experience happens. Um, for all of us, our aesthetic experiences are different from each other. And that's because we are uniquely wired to bring in the world through our conditioning, through our genetics, and through our life experiences. So the piece of music that I may be moved by very likely may be different than the piece of music that someone else is moved by. Um, the kind of art that moves me or the kind of art I create is driven by my experiences and my individual thumbprint, if you will, of an aesthetic experience. So the history of neuroaesthetics has been um, really happening since the beginning of humankind. Um, we all know about the cave paintings that were created or, or thinking about the sunrises and sunsets where um, regardless of where we are, we experience a sense of awe and wonder. But in fact, um, philosophers and uh, scientists and artists have been thinking a lot about neuroaesthetics for a very long time. In the um, 400 BC, Plato pondered the idea of cognition and the act or process of knowing something. How do we really understand the world around us? Later in the 1400s, Leon um, Alberti was widely recognized as a neurohistorian, uh, really looking at the art of art and science together, and began to really document quite a bit about sort of how we began to understand this connection between what we felt and what we saw and how we experienced that. Um, later, Leonardo da Vinci was very interested in looking at anatomy and human emotion, and that really prefigures neuroaesthetics um, in some ways. Uh, as a scientist and an artist, he was one of the early um, neuroaestheticians. 
Um, and then Schleichner uh, pioneered techniques looking at psychophysics to study the aesthetic appreciation. And that came to him through um, an illness where he lost his eyesight and started to really see that, in fact, um, when you lose a sensory, sensory experience, other senses begin to take over. And he was fascinated with sort of the way that our aesthetic appreciation shifted depending upon what was happening with us biologically, but also what was happening with us in the world around us. Um, music therapy program started in, officially started at the universe, at Michigan State University in the 1940s, where we started to see an academic uh, program begin to be developed in the United States. Um, the field of neuroscience wasn't established until the late 50s. So you can see that the study of the brain, serious study of the brain from a neurobiological point of view, started way later than our fascination with this connection between the brain and the arts. In the 70s, the CAT scan was developed, and this was the first time that we really were be able to look non-invasively in what was happening inside of the brain. And the whole field of neuroscience really has fueled the, the, the rapid growth of neuroaesthetics. And technology in and of itself has been a really great partner in helping us understand what's happening inside the brain, but also being used as a potential intervention through things like virtual reality and film and other kinds of technological advances over, over the years. Um, the PET scan and the MRI techniques were developed um, in the late 80s, also giving us greater insight to what was happening inside of the brain. Um, music therapies have begun to be used in the 1990s to treat veterans with PTSD and traumatic brain injury. And what they found there, and we'll talk about this a little later, is that there are no other treatments that have been as effective as helping some of these patients um, come to terms with some of the um, traumatic memories and also with building new skills and coping mechanisms for how they live their lives in the fullest way possible. Uh, the MRI was developed again in the late 90s, again, adding more insight and more knowledge into what was happening during these aesthetic experiences. Um, Samir Zeki in the early 2000s coined the term neuroaesthetics. Samir Zeki is at University College London, um, and he's a visual systems um, neuroscientist who is very interested in understanding the science of beauty and how did we see beauty through the eye and literally began to understand through a system called the default mode network that beauty truly is in the eye of the beholder and that again our life experiences and other um, unique uh, ways that we bring in the world uh, make beauty um, very much a personal experience. And then um, early models outlining cog key cognitive and neural systems that were involved in the aesthetic experience also began to be developed in the, in the early 2000s and continue now. So this field of neuroaesthetics has been um, being developed over time, first through the, as I said, through the philosophers and the artists and the thinkers, then into the neuroscience and the psychology and psychiatry of how the, these, the arts were being used to really becoming a field that has some key principles and foundational understandings about what neuroaesthetics means um, from a basic science point of view through a practice point of view. Um, Charles Lim published uh, a groundbreaking study of neuroscience of creativity in the mid 2000s um, that has added to some of the knowledge about things like uh, improv and flow and beginning to add to the work and sensory perception of how do we integrate what we bring in from outside of the outside of our world to help us create new different things and to think more about innovation and um, and uh, evolving uh, new ideas. Um, Neuroaesthetics now is being launched into the mainstream as a scientific investigation. And we'll share a little bit later uh, some of the things that are happening to really advance the field. Um, in 2018, we began talks with um, the Aspen Institute looking at how to really be able to shape this field and um, 
over the next several years, there'll be a number of um, studies coming out about uh, scoping the entire aesthetic landscape to look very deeply at what do we know about different art forms through the lens of health and well-being. So over the time, there have been a number of discoveries that have emerged. Um, just to name a few, um, in looking at visual arts, we now know that making our art opens the brain's speech and language pathways that can be blocked by trauma. That has been well documented through some of the work with veterans. Um, in listening to music, we know that preferential music can lower blood pressure, pain, anxiety, increase mood and memory, and also can enhance learning and focus for all age groups. The performing arts have um, done quite a bit of work in looking at theater, and we know that theater ex experiences increase perspective taking and empathy. In dance, we see that uh, using dance can relieve tremors and increase mobility for Parkinson's patients and other people suffering with neurodegenerative illnesses. And in looking at architecture and design, there's been a lot of information gained and knowledge learned around uh, the way daylight and natural elements can improve mood and increase creative performance, just, just to name a few. So today I want to talk about four neuroaesthetic concepts that are foundational to how we think about how the arts change our brains and help to uh, change our moods and, and help to enhance health and well-being. And they are uh, sensation and perception, embodied cognition, reward systems, and default mode network. To get a little better idea of how the brain really changes on the arts, I wanna step back and talk a little bit about some of the different areas of the brain that are engaged in different types of art making. Um, for example, the frontal lobe is the part of the brain where cognitive function of reasoning, executive function, parts of speech, voluntary movement, emotions, and problem solving happens. So when I was talking about the work Charles Lim was doing with creativity, it's the frontal lobe where this executive function or self-monitoring um, work um, happens. And this is where he was seeing the greatest activity in looking at creativity. The corpus, corpus callosum is the midline part of the brain. And this is made up of neural tissues and it helps the two brain hemispheres communicate with each other via signals sent through neural pathways. The temporal lobe is where memory and perception as well as speech and auditory functions such as pitch, tone, and selective listening occur. The parietal lobe is where information processing of movement, mathematic orientation, recognition, um, and perception of stimuli such as taste or touch or temperature occur. And the occipital lobe is where visual processing happens. The limbic system is the emotional brain containing the thalamus, the hypothalamus, the amygdala, and the hippocampus. And finally, the cerebellum is associated with regulation and coordination of movement, posture, and balance. So let's talk a little bit about the four neural systems that influence the way the arts change our brain, influence, starting with sensation and perception. Sensation and perception are the processes by which we bring in the world around us, including art and nature. External stimuli like sights, sounds, smells, and tastes come into our brain through our senses and are translated into neurological inputs. I love the quote by neuroanatomist Jill Bolt Taylor, who says, most of us think of ourselves as thinking creatures that feel, but we are actually feeling creatures that think. To fully grasp the deep impact of our surroundings on our brain and being, it helps to understand how we use dozens of senses to navigate the world around us. Even before you drew your first breath, you developed as many as 21 senses in your prenatal home. For example, emerging circuitry for direction, motion, balance, temperature, hormonal reactions, vibrations, and circadian rhythm told you when to sleep and wake up, when to eat, and even when to give your mom a little kick. In utero, you even gain the ability to orient yourself to the Earth's gravitational field. Once born, half of your brain's 100 billion neurons had already been wired together. 
as a multisensory being, you perceive much of your experience via the somatosensory cortex, an area of the brain made up of specialized neurons that monitored your surroundings through your body. The embodied new sponge-like you soaked up every new sensation. Your spinal cord sent information throughout your small body, including your organs and muscles. All the while, your brain created neural networks for memory, emotion, and cognition. Now, embodied cognition recognizes that it's not just our brains that respond to the outside world. Our bodies are very much involved in this process, too. Our bodies are constantly responding to our environment in all kinds of involuntary ways through our autonomic nervous system. This system governs things like our heart rate, body temperature, and blood pressure. If you suddenly feel cold, you get goosebumps. You could shiver at the sound of fingernails or a on a chalkboard or jump when someone sneaks up behind you and yells boo. These are simple examples of embodied cognition. These haptic mechanisms, part of our earliest reptilian brains, can trigger emotional reflexes in the amygdala, hypothalamus, and prefrontal cortex that help us navigate the world. At the most basic level, these responses are physical and psychological changes that influence our behavior and emotions. Neuroscientist Lo Joe Ledoux of New York University explains that happy emotions release morphine-like chemicals into our bloodstream called endorphins, which flood targeted areas of our cortex, inducing a highly pleasurable state. This is what's known as activation of the reward system. When exposed to a rewarding stimuli, the brain responds by increasingly releasing the neurotransmitters like dopamine, and thus the structures associated with the reward system are found along the major dopamine pathways in the brain. In the 50s, James Old and Peter Milne implanted electrodes in the brains of rats and allowed animals to press levers to, to receive a mild burst of, of electrical stimulation to their brains. Olds and Milner discovered that there were certain areas of the brain that rats would repeatedly press a lever to receive stimulation to. One of the rats in their experiment pressed the lever 7,500 times in 12 hours to receive electrical stimulation here. Olds and Milner's experiments were significant because they appeared to verify the existence of brain structures that were devoted to mediating rewarding experiences. The reward system is a feedback loop that can be hardest for good and for bad. The more exposure to a pleasurable experience, the more you want it. And because our brains are inherently responsive to the arts, bathing us in feel-good brain chemicals, art becomes a productive and critical tool for improving our overall health and well-being. And finally, we have the default mode network, which is where the neurological basis for self is housed. The DMN is a network of interconnected brain regions that is active when a person is not focused on the outside world. And we can measure this network through technology such as fMRI. This is a place where memories or a collection of events and facts about oneself is stored. It's known to be the heart of mind wandering, dreams and daytime dreaming. It helps us optimize what we need to remember and what we need to forget. It aids in our envisioning the future. It's a catalyst for wandering. And it's also the place where we think about things that don't have an explicit goal. When you're making art, how you choose to express yourself comes from this network. The default mode network is a filter for what you think is beautiful or not beautiful, memorable or not, meaningful or not. It's what makes art a very personal experience for each of us. So I want to talk a little bit about the impact thinking model I mentioned earlier today. Um, this is a translational research approach to enhance human potential in health, well-being, and learning through the arts. And it's a nine-step process that begins with problem identification. So we're very interested in understanding how to solve a problem through the lens of an art form. And we are agnostic to the art form, and we welcome many different kinds of problems, as I'll share with you with some examples. The second phase is what we call collaborative discovery. So once we've identified a problem that we want to try to solve, we do a lot of research, and that can include literature reviews, interviews, looking at other kinds of similar problems to, in an interdisciplinary approach. 
work to find out what we can about how we might solve this problem through the lens of an art form. We then create a hypothesis. How might this art form address the problems that we're trying to solve? And we design a research study to really look more carefully at how to approach this problem. We implement the research. We analyze the research. We often will refine and retest or make recommendations based on our findings. And then we move into a dissemination and scaling mode. And with the arts, this is a very important step because many art forms are not well scaled and have not been able to be successful at disseminating them um, for many, many reasons, including um, policy or um, funding or, or dissemination programs that haven't clearly articulated some of the needs of the, of the problem. So we're very focused on thinking about data dissemination. And then we're also very interested in looking at the impact of a, of a solution. So has it worked? How well has it worked? What's the kind of dosage and duration of a particular impact um, thinking uh, solution? Um, what we like about this model is that it's a spiral. And so like all things, the more you learn, the more you can inform a process. So oftentimes this is a spiral that will repeat itself as we gain information and, and repeat and go through as we learn about some of the problems that we're trying to solve. So I'm gonna share a little bit about some of the programs that we've been working on to better illustrate how impact thinking can work. Our first impact thinking project, Guitar Lessons for Parkinson's Disease, explores music therapy as a physical and mental health intervention for Parkinson's patients. In partnership with the Center for Music and Medicine at Johns Hopkins, this project brought together neurologists and musicians to create a series of guitar lessons specifically designed for people with Parkinson's disease. Here we hypothesized that moving hands, arms, and fingers rhythmically on the guitar to make music will benefit arms and hand function as well as cognition and mood in individuals with Parkinson's disease. Over a 12-week period, participants were randomly assigned to treatment and control groups and assessed at the outset and every six weeks on a variety of measures. Post-treatment, we observed improvements in motor function, functional plasticity, mood, including depression and anxiety, as well as an overall quality of life. One of the opportunities and challenges of research in the arts is a need to create personalized experiences for maximum impact. After all, what each of us considers beautiful, meaningful, memorable, and rewarding is unique and dictated by an alchemy of environment, conditioning, and genetics. In this project, Tailored Activity Program for Dementia, or TAP for short, we consider how personalizing arts activities to patient preference impacts their level of stress and agitation. TAP was originally created by Dr. Laura Gitlin and extends research on on a Johns Hopkins Bayview nursing program that has trained family members to lead tailored arts activities at home with their loved ones. Here we hypothesize that a tailored arts activity program in an outpatient setting can reduce agitation and aggression in patients with dementia as measured by salivary cortisol and alpha amylase levels. This is the first time that research has examined the neurobiological underpinnings of this intervention. One book is a collaboration among several organizations to provide seventh and eighth graders in Baltimore City with the opportunity to connect by reading the same book. The goal of one book is to understand whether building a conversation in the community and communicating through the arts can help students understand themselves and each other better, and to understand how friends, school staff, families can be involved in that conversation. This year's book, the Long Way Down by Jason Reynolds provides an opportunity for students to read about and share their experiences with street violence. IM Lab conducted a pre-survey of 1,200 students in dozens of schools to gather perceptions and experiences related to the theme of the book. We will conduct post-program surveys and focus groups to assess changes in the school level in 2020. One final impact thinking project I wanted to share focuses on the potential of new technology and the arts. In partnership with Drexel University, virtual reality for creative arts therapy examines the effectiveness of art therapy, both guided and unguided, using virtual reality tools. Researchers are using Google's tilt brush technology to allow patients to paint in 3D virtual spaces. 
The study will measure reward perception using F mirrors as well as self perception of mood, stress, anxiety, and self efficacy. Beyond our impact thinking research, we have partnered with a number of organizations across different sectors, including businesses and government, to explore the potential of neuroaesthetics. Last spring, we worked with Google to develop a neuroaesthetics exhibit during the Milan Design Week. The exhibit, which we called A Space for Being, was designed to showcase design's impact on our biology and well being. In partnership with Google, we made architecture and Muto, the furniture company, we designed, built, and styled a 6,000 square foot exhibit space with three unique rooms as a centerpiece, all with their own look and feel, furnishings, lighting, textures, color, muse, music, and even scent. Each visitor was outfitted with a custom wearable band that we partnered with Google's ATAP to develop. The band captured physical responses off of three distinct sensors as guests walked through each room. At the end of the experience, we provided each guest with their personal signals and suggested in which space they felt most at ease based on their physiology. For attendees, most of which were designers, observing their intellectual responses versus their physiological responses to each room was a revelation. The mind and body weren't always in sync. Lastly, we've worked with government organizations to explore the role of the arts in health. Creative Forces is an initiative of the National Endowment for the Arts in partnership with the U.S. Departments of Defense and Veterans Affairs, as well as state and local art agencies. Its mission is to improve the health, wellness, and quality of life for military and veteran populations exposed to trauma, as well as their families and caregivers. The program uses creative arts therapies at clinical sites through the country, plus a health program for rural and remote areas. In clinical settings, creative arts therapists provide art, music, and dance, and movement therapy, as well as creative writing instruction for military patients and veterans impacted by PTSD and traumatic brain injury. This work offers an important adjunct therapy that helps patients recover from the invisible wounds of war. Creative Forces continues to invest in research on the impact and benefits, physical, emotional, economic, of these innovative interventions. I wanna close by saying that what I have shared today are many exciting and promising neuroaesthetics interventions. There are thousands more. We sit at the intersection of a new field that will unleash the potential of the arts. Together with the Aspen Institute, our lab, and many others around the world, we have launched the NeuroArts Blueprint that brings this work into the mainstream of society. We hope you'll join us on our mission to realize the full potential of the arts to improve our collective health and well-being. Thank you. Susan, thank you. This is Kelly coming back. Uh, I personally had no idea how many different ways the arts can affect our brain, particularly in these therapeutic ways. So thank you. We now have time for a, Q, a section of Q&A. Uh, and we can take questions from our live audience, uh, as well as drawing on questions submitted ahead of time. So I'll get us started with a very topical application. Um, so I was interested to hear you talk about the ways arts can potentially reduce stress, particularly a concern today as a novel coronavirus is disrupting life and society across the world. What role do you see the arts having in the way we as individuals function during this pandemic? Thanks, Kelly. Um, um, and thank you for joining for the folks that are live today. Um, uh, I hope that this um, was a helpful way to spend your time in such uncertain and unprecedented times. Um, I think we've known for a long time that the arts um, are a powerful tool for health and well being. And I think um, we have used them um, in our individual lives and also in communities. Um, I believe strongly that art is going to be an essential for the maintenance of our mental health over the coming months ahead. Um, we know that the arts are helpful in addressing things like loneliness and stress, anxiety, um, and other kinds of uh, mental health issues that we're facing um, as we move through um, this corona COVID-19 time. Um, 
there are some really interesting studies that have been done around art as a release valve for us. Um, we know, for example, that just 45 minutes of making art can reduce um, stress up to about 25% of, um, of um, cortisol. Um, and, and what's amazing about that is that you don't have to be good at art in order to be um, successful in reducing stress. Um, we also know that art brings people together. And I think that's something that we're seeing all over the world. I was very moved by the Italian singing um, from their balconies during lockdown and from stories of children putting artwork in their windows as people took an afternoon stroll to just get some fresh air. Um, and there's many other stories that we're hearing about the way art is being used to bring us together. Um, and I think as we naturally gravitate towards the art, in arts and crises, we're gonna see um, this happen more and more over the coming months. So interesting and particularly gratifying as someone who is not, does not consider myself particularly uh, artistic that the effects of engaging in art extend even to novices. Um, I think that's a real mythology about, you know, art and being good at it. And I think it's done a disservice to how we all make art. Um, you know, I find myself writing these days and last night my husband and I decided we were going to dance. Um, and, you know, if you think about those, those little things that really bring you joy, a lot of them are about sharing our voices and, um, and connecting with others in any way we can. I really like that. That's such a nice message for, for these times. Um, thinking of therapeutic benefits, how can art be used therapeutically for those with neurodegenerative or neuropsychiatric disorders? So I touched a little bit on this during the, the presentation around personalized art activities for patients with dementia, um, the TAP program, and also the guitar lessons to improve motor skills for patients with Parkinson's disease. Um, there's a lot of work happening, happening there. Um, one notable program that I didn't mention is the Mark Morris for Parkinson's program that is now in 28 countries around the world where dance is being used to help people with Parkinson's and um, they're getting really, really great uh, results. Um, some of the results are lasting um, just um, the length of the, the, the dance experience, but others are reducing symptoms for sometimes hours and even days. So these are integrative and complementary approaches to some neurodegenerative um, illnesses that are showing great promise. Um, we're also seeing um, work with stroke patients in virtual reality where range of motion is being ex extended through um, this sort of uh, immersive experience. With, with neuropsychiatric disorders, um, our lab in partnership with um, One Mind um, has be, have begun um, a, an interesting scoping review of um, serious mental illness and music. And um, we've now um, mined about over 20,000 um, studies um, looking at the role of music and mental health, whether you're the maker or the beholder. And we're finding some really interesting um, things, one um, around preferential music and the importance of that. Um, we're also looking at um, context to when music is shared for serious mental illness, um, uh, dosage and duration. Um, and we're hoping that through this analysis of the research, we can understand um, how the studies are being conducted, looking more closely at some of the rigor um, and um, standards around these studies, and also looking at gaps and opportunities that we can hopefully um, develop pilots that we can begin to look more closely at ways to address things like schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, uh, uh, PTSD, and we're also looking at um, generalized anxiety. So your, your work occupies such a rich space at this intersection between clinical studies, uh, neuro, neurobiological studies, uh, the arts, um, as well as the, the effect of arts on people, and then a discipline completely outside of science, which is art itself. So to paraphrase a couple of questions that I'm seeing come in, can you comment a little bit about how your uh, impact thinking um, is similar or dissimilar to the scientific method as, as um, commonly taught? And also what kinds of variables you measure uh, to, to assess these outcomes? That's a great question. 
Um, I sometimes answer this by saying um, the impact thinking method is, um, is similar to impact thinking, but the difference is that the impact thinking method is really um, the scientific method played by an orchestra. Um, we're, we're very interested in interdisciplinary approaches. And so a lot of people talk about interdisciplinary, but in this field, it is critical to bring researchers and artists together. It's critical to bring uh, science and um, clinicians together um, and to also have very strong um, end user participation. So this is, an, this is really about playing together, different people coming together who have very different perspectives um, and training um, to be able to look to solve a problem. Um, at the beginning of the impact thinking model, um, you, you, you see that we're very problem forward. Um, and so defining a problem, and that could be, as you can see, the range of problems are very broad, but you have to get very specific on what are you solving for. Um, we find that um, we, we, we put together a team for impact thinking, so it includes a, a researcher, and that can be a researcher from a range of fields, depending upon what problem we're trying to solve for. We bring together different kinds of artists. We also bring together different types of practitioners and have always some kind of advocate for the end user, as I mentioned. Um, when we move into collaborative discovery, um, most um, scientific methods um, do literature reviews, um, and they're usually field specific. In impact thinking, we are very broad in terms of looking across multiple fields and, and across multiple sectors. We also do um, uh, interviews, we will do site visits. Um, we look at this collaborative discovery period as a time to bring a lot of new knowledge forward with the goal of translation, translating that knowledge into a hypothesis um, and ultimately into research. So we think this collaborative discovery piece is a different way to come at um, gaining knowledge to inform research. Um, in the research area, um, we're looking at combining different types of research. So um, we may do um, qualitative and quantitative research in the in the research phase, depending upon what is our hypothesis and what we're solve, what we're looking to solve for. We also um, are really interested in um, the role of technology, and there are a number because we're always we're, we work with with people. Um, with, these are human studies, so we are really interested in um, things like the Mobi technology, where in real time, we can see what's happening in the brain. So sometimes we're using EEG, I mentioned FNIRS. Um, we also use um, fMRI. Um, we've, we've done some work with PET scans. We're really interested in the neurobiological data, but we're also interested in um, self-perception and qualitative measures. So we're really looking to come at these problems from a, a, a multiple range of research experiences to, to begin to parse out what's happening. You know, studying the arts is not easy. It's not a reductionist approach. It, the arts are generative. So how do we carefully de design studies that are rigorous, and that have high standards that the field can begin to, to follow. So we are really experimenting with how to do that in the, in the research phase and the analysis phase mm -hmm. of the impact study model. And then the last thing I'll say about the impact thinking model compared to the scientific model is that dissemination and scaling is not something that um, basic science in and of itself has a mandate to do. Um, certainly the, the, the fields build on themselves and research builds on the shoulder of other researchers work. But in the arts, even if there is an intervention that has been seen and proven to be effective, it is very difficult to scale. It's very difficult to get funding for, for, for the arts, but it's very difficult to disseminate and scale. And if a researcher is doing that project, that may not be um, in the past, researchers are not necessarily bringing um, research into practice and then looking at how to scale that. So we're, we've been looking at things like implementation science and scaling science to really
and interventions to scale it really moved us into um, thinking about uh, that evaluation more carefully and bringing together other partners, including policymakers and funders at a state and federal and also global level to look at how we might be able to do that. So just asking a follow-up question on that in terms of these different uh, practitioners and scientists and artists, do you have any examples where you can point um, that where, where you saw scientists and artists learning something about each other's work or collaborating together? Uh, so it has been extraordinary to um, talk in theory about interdisciplinary work and then to, to actually bring these folks together. Um, it's a messy process um, and it requires great listening and, and, and really allowing to, others to share what they know to create something new. I think it's probably one of the most creative processes. Um, and I've always, I've always said that scientists are, 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 are so creative, um, but when you bring them together with artists and practitioners, um, a kind of alchemy happens that's really extraordinary. Um, I, I think we of the projects that we talked about today, um, Creative Forces, I think is a really interesting one to, to talk about. Um, this is the military, right? These are veterans or active military who um, are in great need of uh, new ways to help address PTSD and traumatic brain injury. So you have um, patients, you have the military patients who are really open to um, trying new things. You have art therapists or therapeutic artists who are bringing forward um, different modalities that they have seen work um, in other settings. And you have clinicians um, who have protocol and that have to be followed. And you have researchers who have been doing work on sensory or motor learning or other, 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 other basic research associated with some of the issues around PTSD and traumatic brain injury. As they can come together, it's bi-directional. And so by that I mean researchers are providing knowledge to the practitioners and the clinicians, and practitioners and users and clinicians are also providing information to each other and to the researchers. So what we're seeing is that the, the quality and the precision of the work is, is getting stronger and more uh, powerful as these folks who usually don't come together are coming together to try to solve a problem that hasn't been able to be solved before. And so I think there is much to be learned about how this process plays out across a number of different um, problems. But we're, we're learning a lot about how to bring these very different groups together against a goal for solving a problem through the lens of the arts. I'm seeing a lot of questions about uh, children's brains and the impact of art on kids uh, in both a regular normal classroom setting and also on their conditions of ADHD or test anxiety. What are some highlights of some recent findings in this area? So um, I'm, I'm really glad to see questions about learning um, for, for children, but also across the lifespan. Um, you know, when children, um, use um, any kind of art or play experience, um, it's, it's always helpful to learning. And I think um, besides the cognitive skills that we're talking about, the social emotional brain is developing so rapidly in these early years. Um, you know, we're born with, with so many neurons, um, but this connectivity really happens through interactivity and, and, and flexibility and, and artistic expression. So it's really wonderful to see schools allow for the kind of multi-sensory experiences that the arts can bring because that's really creating neural pathways that will, will serve children throughout their lives. Um, I think there's also a lot of work being done now around um, trauma in young children and I think you know, that's, that's been happening before the, the COVID-19 um, epidemic. But, but when we think about the way that the arts can be helpful in connecting children to each other and also helping to um, build stronger nervous systems, I think the arts are a really great opportunity and they're immediate uh, and they can be done anywhere and they can be done with others. Um, and so um, it's a, I think it's a really great um, thing to be thinking more about. And 
for adults, is there a difference between an artist's brain and a normal person's brain? You know, I think that's a great question. Um, and, and, you know, certainly there are people that have um, inherent talent. Um, and we talked about this in the presentation where you don't have to be good at art in order to have art be useful, a useful tool for, um, for, for, for health and well-being and for learning. Um, the artists, artists are, um, so artists have talents that, and hone talents that some of us don't have. But inherently, the artist's brain is not different than um, anybody else's brain um, in terms of how, how it works. So, um, you know, Charles Lim's work around flow and, um, and creativity is interesting. You know, he put um, musicians initially into an fMRI machine, um, accomplished musicians, and asked them to play a rehearsed piece um, and then asked them to play an improv piece. Um, and what you could see in, in the brain is that when they were playing an improv piece, they were able to, um, to, um, to inhibit um, a, regu a regulation part of the brain that was critiquing what they were doing. Um, so they were able to have more flow. Um, when they were just, when they were playing a piece that they rehearsed, they were critiquing it along the way. So um, I think the ability to be able to shut off the self-regulation parts of your brain is something that um, artists that improv and create have learned to build that muscle, if you will. Um, and I think that's something that we all can do. Um, and they, they certainly do it as high performing um, artists. But the ability to be able to self-regulate and not um, critique yourself is really important for creating for all of us. And I think it's something that we each have the ability to be able to do. It's an interesting commentary on, I suppose, trying to reduce people's anxiety about being creative. I would say I suffer from that. If I'm, I'm asked to do something creative, I kind of freeze up. Um, and I think that's common. What do you advise for people who, who feel that way? So um, I'm reading a really great book right now called Bird by Bird by Annie Lamont. It's about writing. And um, she talks about um, perfection is the um, oppressor. And that I think a lot of times we think that we have to be perfect in order to be good. And when you can release yourself from that and, 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 and not judge your own work, um, but really just let that making happen, um, I think we start to be able to learn and know things about ourselves that we might not have had access to. Um, you know, the unconscious brain is, um, is, is so fantastical and it's, it's there. And I think the arts allow us to bring that forward. But when we're critiquing it and looking for this sense of perfection, that's, that's you know, very societal, you know, we, we have these belief systems about what's good and not good, what's beautiful and not beautiful, that are social norms that sometimes stop us from being able to just truly express our authentic selves. And so I think um, I would take a page from Anna Lamont, which is, um, you know, don't seek perfection. Um, she does this thing where she has a one inch uh, frame on her desk and all she tries to do is write one thought, one good thought. Um, and then another thought comes and another thought comes, but she's not trying to write the novel. So I think starting small with a small project, um, right now I'm making collage card. Um, that I can send a little three by five cards. And, um, and you know, it's amazing when you think of someone and then you make a piece of art for them, um, you just don't know what you're going to make, but it's it's it, it, it's very satisfying, and I think it's very healing. I like that piece of advice, especially in light of today's time. Do you have other recommendations for people who want to get deeper into this field and the studies that you've mentioned? So there are um, many many people um, that are working in this at this intersection. Um, if you go to our website, which is artsandmindlab.org. Um, there are lots of references on the blog that you can sort of pick up on. Um, I, I also think that um, there are um, 
just if you start to Google areas of interest, art forms, um, art and Parkinson's, art and dementia, music and dementia, it's really easy to start to find a thread of many things that are happening all over the world. I think this field is coalescing and is really becoming um, something that will um, be a discipline. And, um, and it's just not hard to find people that are doing really interesting work in this area. Great. Um, so what would you say are some big takeaways for people in the audience today? Well, I think art is, is you, we are artists. We are all artists. And I think in, in this very um, um, immediate time, I think don't forget that. So at a very personal level, I think making is, is, is our human right. Um, sharing our voice is our human right. I also want to stress that there is great and growing science around the power of the arts to heal and to help us grow and thrive. And that I think it's the science that is really going to move the arts from a nice to have to a have to have. And do you have recommendations on how people would integrate more art into their lives? On the one hand, it feels obvious, but on the other, how do people get started? Well, I, I always think that you start from where you are. Um, you know, uh, in, in the music field, um, uh, music teachers will say, you know, the instrument will find you. And I think that's true. Um, and with art, I think it's very similar. Art sort of with a lowercase a, you know, think about what you already um, do. Um, you know, maybe it's knitting, maybe it's collage, maybe it's, you know, dancing, maybe it's singing, maybe it's taking a walk in nature, you know, um, maybe it's reading, maybe it's writing. Um, I think we each have a sense of how we find and share our voices. And so um, part of, I think the thing that's so important is to really um, uh, think about what you've done throughout your lives um, and, and begin to hone some of those things or pull them back out or dust them off. Um, you know, we're asked to walk 10,000 steps a day. Um, you know, what if we were asked to make um, one kind of self-expression or experience, um, be the beholder of an art experience once a day. Um, in England, um, University College London um, did, has done some epidemiology work and they have found that in analyzing data sets from the UK, that one art or cultural experience a month can actually help um, people live longer and live healthier. So, you know, we're starting to see some of the um, long-term benefits of uh, making and beholding art um, that I think are really directional. Well, thank you, Susan. It's been so enjoyable to pick your brain and, and get this wonderful overview of the field. On behalf of the audience, I'd like to thank you. Uh, and I want to thank the audience for joining us at this webinar today. After we close, a short survey will come up and we encourage and appreciate your feedback so we can continue improving brainfacts.org webinars. Thanks again, and we look forward to your being part of future events. Thank you, everyone.